my favorite HVAC franchise. You pay your $43,000 franchise fee to join the brand if you're getting one territory. And $800,000 is what you would do at minimum if you follow the system correctly in the first year. In fact, you might do a million one in the first year, and then eventually you'll get up to the average, which is close to four million. So you think you can afford to pay a 6% royalty for life after paying your entrance fee? Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owners Association, where real estate investors have found success since 1968. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single-family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 428. Today, we're going to talk about franchising. In simple terms, franchising is a business in which the owner licenses the operations, products, branding, and knowledge in exchange for a franchise fee. Many real estate investors are also drawn to franchising because of its entrepreneurial aspects and the ability to create passive income and financial freedom. And my guest today, Lance Growlick, is considered the king of franchising. Lance has over 25 years of experience with companies such as TGI Fridays, Wingstop, Krispy Kreme Donuts, and Pink Box in Las Vegas. Lance also hosts the popular podcast, Eye on Franchising. Lance, welcome to the show. Ryan, thank you for having me. Thanks for the great introduction. You know, franchising isn't really a topic that we've talked about on this real estate rental property owner and real estate investor podcast, but we were talking before the show why it, it is such a good fit with, with our listeners. Why don't you share some of what you were telling me? Real estate is an amazing, amazing business or industry or category, if you will. And by the way, I tell everybody the way I grew up as an entrepreneur, I, I call it the three pillars of investing, real estate, business ownership, and Wall Street. And I grew up with all three of those in my house. Grandpa number one was a, a business owner. He created his own supermarket empire. Grandpa number two was a real estate attorney, investor, commercial, residential, and dad. His company was the largest over-the-counter trading house on Wall Street. So I grew up with all of this unfolding in front of me. I dabbled and did work or investing in all three segments. But I loved the franchise aspects of things more than anything. Real estate is phenomenal, and plenty of people do that just full time. But the bottom line is cash flow, building equity, having the ability to write off those investments or deductions, depending on what your exact situation is. And franchising is often overlooked because of the perception you have to be a millionaire to own a franchise. Well, it's a lot more investments than McDonald's these days. I have tons of opportunities for 250000 or less, and you can be a semi-absentee owner, which is a fancy franchise term for keep your day job, keep your investing going, and work on the business, but not necessarily in the business by hiring a manager. Kind of like real estate investors do. They hire a GC or they hire somebody to handle their fix and flips. They have somebody managing their their holds, their buy and holds, and, and what have you. They might just be doing some wholesaling. So there's a lot of correlation between between the industries. Talk about your your early entry into franchising. Like, How did it come on your radar, and, and how did you uh, get started in that area? I was working on Wall Street, sitting on a trading desk, fresh out of college, but I had done that sort of stuff throughout high school. And, and, and then after college, I realized, how am I going to tell my father I'm bored to tears? I don't want to be in middle in the middle of this concrete jungle known as New York City, I feel like I need greener pastures. And I was always a trailblazer, always that rainmaker. Dad did tell me when I was younger that I was probably unemployable as I got older and grew into my own because, you know, you grow up with all these entrepreneurs. Nobody has a schedule. Everybody gets to do whatever they want. You know, my dad attended every soccer game, baseball game, track uh, event. 
you had that flexibility. So how I fell into it, I was bored. And an uncle who is an early tech success calls me and said, I heard you're bored. I'm living in Arizona right now on top of Mummy Mountain in Scottsdale. I want to build a billion dollar restaurant franchise group. And I'm like, billion dollars? This is 1989. A billion dollar? What the heck? And I joined him and I helped him build a TGI Fridays franchise at the time when Fridays was incredible to 225 million a year, which is incredible numbers. A lot of acquisitions, a lot of new new store openings. I like to say I certainly got my master's in restaurant franchising working with Uncle Steven. And then he got bored after five years and went back to Asia. But he did he did assemble some other things. I think he probably got up to $350 million in, in revenue with his other uh, assets as well. But I got to see, Brian, how easy franchising can be. You're following somebody else's blueprint, somebody else's model. There's no banging your head against the wall trying to figure out what's going to work. These are proven systems. Now, Fridays... And it's different conversation. Fridays is obviously not what it was. And that's what happens with certain brands. Certain brands are not the same over time due to leadership. It's kind of like in real estate investing. Certain areas of the country might be hot for a while. And then you pull out and say, yeah, I don't know that Vegas is easy to work with. By the way, my my daughter's boyfriend's family has 1,700 houses between California and Las Vegas. So, you know, but that's how I got my start. And then I ventured off and did my own stuff with Wingstop and Krispy Kreme Donuts in two states with a partner. And Pink Box Donuts is a brand that I started from scratch when a friend friend called me and said, hey, can you create us a gourmet donut shop? And he had the name. I ended up getting the trademark on the name, which was phenomenal, and launched that brand. And it was an outrageous success almost immediately. You get a little bit of luck when you have some experience and you have the right timing and it worked out and I sold that. I'm a builder, not a maintainer. I get very bored easily, as you heard at the beginning of my story, but franchising is about modeling success. So that's what I do today as a franchise broker in my retirement is I love to help people. A lot of people get into their first business. I helped a family worth about $850 million dollars. They called me through a family friend saying, what do I do? I got $5 million in my sock drawer. I want to help the kids with something, and I'm not creating anything else myself. I want guaranteed success. That's what I gave them. Let's go back to TGI Friday. I mean, you were brought in, um, you were unemployable, by your own words, um, brought in by your uncle saying, hey, let's, let's build a franchise. He just wanted somebody he could trust on the inside. I was not a brainiac with franchises at that point but I was at least a family member he could trust. What did you learn during that period? Like what what really happened? Like what were some of the challenges, the things that you came to understand about franchising that then made you go on and to do all these other uh, projects? As a young wannabe entrepreneur, I dabbled in a lot of things like a lot of people do when they're 14, 15 and what have you. And I, I realized looking at the roadmap, if you will, for TGI Fridays, that again, it, it I don't have to think terribly hard. The menus, the staffing plan, the labor matrix, if you will, the processes, the systems, the procedures, the purchasing, the marketing, everything is laid out for you. And I thought to myself, man, this is a model. Every time I thought of doing anything, I had a t-shirt business, sweatshirt business, Russell Athletic brand stuff. I sold at a flea market when I was 14. I did really well, but I had to learn. It took me six months to figure out what the heck I was doing. With a franchise, you're jumping into somebody's system. This The same way a lot of real estate investors or people in general, I have friends that were part of a Tony Robbins mastermind or a Richard Branson mastermind or anyone else for that matter. And guess what? You're paying a hefty entrance fee for that, 25 grand plus. But the reason is there's value and there is value in a franchise. Let me tell you my favorite recent franchise story. Guy comes to me with his dad. We're on a Zoom call. He said, I need you to tell my dad he's doing this wrong. His dad created his own HVAC company. Dad was very proud. Dad did a great job. 
Took him eight years to get to about 800,000 in revenue. The dad sat there as like, well, why would I do a franchise? Well, the reason you would do a franchise is that my favorite HVAC franchise, you pay your $43,000 franchise fee to join the brand if you're getting one territory. And $800,000 is what you would do at minimum if you follow the system correctly in the first year. In fact, you might do a million one in the first year, and then eventually you'll get up to the average, which is close to $4 million. So you think you can afford to pay a 6% royalty for life after paying your entrance fee to learn all the systems and be hooked up to the purchasing channels and what have you and have a success coach and mentorship and collaboration with people that are about to exit for 60 or $100 million that knew what you knew when they started. I had a guy exit a garage door repair and maintenance or installation brand for about $98 million recently. He didn't know anything about garage doors. What is it about the system? I mean, you're, you're talking about the system. You have people who have figured out how to build a business on their own and built their own systems. But uh, yeah, I'd imagine convincing them, hey, plug into a, a proven franchise system and you'll do even better. What is the difference there? What, what are they going to find? A lot of it is the aggressive nature of the marketing, the branding, a typical independent. Let's talk home services. I've been talking that for a little bit. So home services, when when an average homeowner, like my wife, a lot of the women are making these phone calls for whatever reason. When my wife reaches out to find somebody for air conditioning, fix our air conditioning unit, a lot of independents aren't going to answer the phone immediately. Or maybe the office will answer the phone. But you're not going to get an answer to your question immediately. In a franchise, most of them have in in house call centers, sales centers, appointment centers, whatever you want to whatever you want to call them. They have the systems and technology in place to capture the customers, get them their answers, get them the bids much faster than typical independents. Now there are plenty of independent home service brands out there. That, that can do it as well as a franchise. Most of them cannot, which is why one hour heating and air conditioning is the number one air conditioning brand in the United States, which is one of my franchises. I got my wife's niece and uh, her husband, not even 30 years old, they bought their first territory recently outside of Texas, outside of Austin, Texas. So it's the marketing. I have a friend who has a power washing brand. What is the average person with a power washer in the United States doing revenue a year, do you think? $150,000 maybe? two hundred. dollars These guys are doing $40,000, some of them, in their second month because when they're plugged into the five marketing methodologies that they do, it's unreal what the results are. And in this power washing business, the corporate entity did $2.2 million last year in freezing cold suburban Pennsylvania with a net of 35%. So franchises understand how to build and scale better. Kind of like in real estate, the guy that has 30 doors and does fix and flips on a regular basis 10 years later, thinks back to, holy cow, I still remember my first flip and how awful that was when I didn't understand systems and did everything wrong. You know, you adapt and you learn. And if you don't want the struggle, if you don't want that serious struggle that everybody goes through, you hire that coach or mentor and franchising could be your coach or mentor, essentially. You mentioned the five power marketing tools. What do you mean by that? In this case, this is a brand called Rolling Suds. I don't know if I can name all five right off the top of my head, but I can tell you they have a gentleman that writes letters. He's, he's a writer that has email lists of commercial accounts in every city in America that he wants. And he'll write letters, emails to companies, HOAs, property management companies to say, we have a power washer and a team like no other, soap, sanitizer, we can do things faster, we can clean a, the outside of your building four stories up without any scaffolding, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of times, because it's a very unique niche, They'll, they'll get gigs, gigs because, because of that. All kinds of digital marketing. There's all kinds of very creative ways to get business, but it's really the know-how of 
contacting, in this case, property managers and HOAs. Everybody's got their niche. But like when you join a neighborly brand, which I saw last night in an early in an event here, Neighborly has 17, 18 brands that they own. They did almost $4 billion in revenue across all their brands, from Glass Doctor to Mr. Appliance to Mr. Handyman. So here's an advantage. You join them, and their marketing department of over 100 people will send out mailers in your market to say, the Glass Doctor is now open in your area. You've been a customer of Mr. Handyman. You've been a customer of you know, Mr. Electric or whatever brand in the past. So that customer data, everybody listening understands, is incredibly valuable. One of the recent podcast episodes I heard you talking to Mike Menino about, he's sending brownies to people, he's sending letters or postcards to people on a regular basis. Franchising, they, they do all that. Digital marketing, mailers, everything to stay in contact and get in front of customers. Because at the end of the day, you know, it's the no like and trust factor. You're gonna do business with people you know, like, and trust, especially when you're letting them in, in your house. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about Green Property Management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then Green Property Management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is health care for you and your family. When I made this transition, myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your healthcare insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at RCB Associates LLC.com. Yeah, Lance, I, I'd imagine that a lot of people who are new to franchising and you know listening to this podcast who might be saying, okay, maybe I'll go do a fix and flip, invest in real estate, maybe I'll I'll buy a franchise. They're all approaching it from the same way. Like there, there's a lot to learn, but I hear you talking about franchise coaching. Like, what is the process you take people through when they're kind of new to this concept? and exploring, like what, what are the considerations that you take them through? It's a very fun process. The first step, I have people do an assessment that's on my website at lancegralic.com or ionfranchising.com. I can, if you if you DM me, you know, Brian, if you DM me Brian on, on Instagram or send me a message anywhere, I'll know where you came from and I'll send you the assessment. And it helps me and you understand, based on your life experiences, your mindset, your skill set, what could be great for you. And that's a starter. And then we ask, I ask all kinds of questions to understand more about you, the more vulnerable you get, so I can understand your goals. Everybody's got different goals. You know, everybody's got different goals. So financial and otherwise, time freedom, money freedom. So based on your goals. I mean, I got a guy, a spray foam genie franchise, and it's 100% absentee. You talk about perfect for real estate investors that don't want to invest any time. I have a guy in New Jersey that just bought locations in Oklahoma because he had some friends there, family, and it fit him, bought a four-store market, and he doesn't have to do really anything to manage that. So very appealing to real estate investors. They're going to sell out the country soon enough, but there's still opportunities available there. Tell us a little bit more about some of your other franchises. You mentioned Krispy Kreme and Pink Box. Like, let's talk about Krispy Kreme for a moment. It's, it, it sounds like you bought some Krispy Kreme franchises, or were you involved in it in a different capacity? I had a family friend, that investment banker, Dartmouth MBA, that, that got the franchise. He was the second franchisee of Krispy Kreme. 
To be honest, he didn't do, he had the sales, but didn't have the profitability because he hired the wrong people. At the end of the day, whether you're doing real estate or business ownership, it's, it's really about your people. No, nobody built an empire by themselves, and you have to have great people around you. I, I happen to learn how to master building a team, building an appropriate corporate, corporate culture. So he and I were good friends as he launched his first Krispy Kreme in Las Vegas, first one on the West Coast, here in East Coast, Southeast brand specifically. And needless to say, his staff was not great. His sales were phenomenal. And he basically fired everybody and brought me in as a partner. And we got to 25 million a year pretty quickly by having the appropriate people in place, expanded to Utah, and were very, were very, very successful. And I was with him for years. Got a nice buyout, left, and I think he brought his sister in to run the business. You know, again, I'm, I'm a builder. I'm not a maintainer. And building is a Krispy Kreme franchise and coming in and kind of fixing the problems that were there. What did you identify? I, you mentioned people issues, but what else did you identify that you were able to say, OK, here's what we need to fix? Yeah, I mean, it was all it was all loosey goosey because of the wrong people. So you, you know, the, there's a, <laughs> the old metaphor about get the right people on the bus before you move the bus. So I had to stop this bus known as the business and, and multiple businesses he had and get everybody off the bus that was not functioning or working at the highest level and not even necessarily with the highest integrity. There was quite a bit of theft as well. And I hired a, a key manager, Deb, who had worked with me before. And we literally assessed everything from top to bottom. They didn't know how to purchase. They, the marketing was okay. But you know, having a people problem is bad enough. But that's about the biggest problem you can have. It's a, it was a systemic problem. So once we fixed starting top down, it was a lot easier. What is the root of the people problem? Is it, I mean, how do you identify when you're going to have that people problem? Is it attitude? First of all, it's all standards. It's all, it's all based on standards. Can the people that you have hold your standards? You know, again, in contracting terms, if you're, if you're fixing and flipping a house and you look at the slab that was installed and, and it has an edge on it from the 80s and we're in 2023, you're going to go, who the heck is designing this crap? Like what? There, there's a certain standard that we're looking for in dress code and customer service. Now, fortunately or unfortunately, we have things like Yelp and Google reviews to just open up and sadly use as a barometer. You can look at Krispy Kreme donut shops across the country and you could say what you want about Yelp and Google, Google reviews, and you can compare and say, well, it seems like we have the worst Google reviews and Yelp reviews anywhere in the country. Well, you, you have to create those KPIs, those metrics, those pieces that fit into the standards that you're looking to set. But just in, you know, I'll tell you at Wingstop, just in labor alone, I was president of the Franchise Advisory Council for Wingstop. I get a lot of phone calls on how to improve imp performance. And a lot of people would call and ask about my scheduling or my team scheduling at all these stores. How was I so effective in labor when they weren't? Now, Brian, as you can imagine, people listening might think, well, the wages, depending, depending on where you are, the wages, the wages. That's not what you do. In order to look at KPIs and certain metrics, you compare man hours or woman hours or people hours. How many hours of labor does it take to run a Krispy Kreme donut shop doing a million five a year? And break that down based on hours of operations, compare apples to apples. And people would continuously realize that my staff tended to be more efficient. Why was my staff more efficient? I had less turnover. I had better people. And you could break it down to very specific things. But oftentimes, it became a visual. I have to come to your store and see this for myself. Oh, I see. You have the guy dropping the chicken in the fryer that's also tossing wings in, in the sauces and prepping for the expediter. So in every business, whether it's real estate, business ownership, HVAC company specifically or otherwise, there are sort of the hacks. And there are th this is why the collaboration being in a franchise system is huge, because there are people that are doing a million and a half dollars a year with an individual franchise, 
and they're happy as can be. But there's other people doing two million, and competitive nature takes over, and you start to think, why is Brian Hamrick so good at this? And I'm spending about the same amount of time on my business. Why can't I achieve what Brian is doing? And it's naturally one of those things where people just work a little bit harder or smarter because they're learning from thy neighbor. And there's nothing more incredible than doing the exact same thing as your neighbor in a franchise. And it's pretty, you know, the rising, a rising tide lifts all ships. One of my favorite things is at, at Wingstop, the highest volume Wingstop opening was this one, my fourth store. We did $34,931.52. Average unit volume in the franchise disclosure document for a Wingstop when I joined was $600,000. That's it. So, you know, over time, you're going to grow. You're going to absolutely grow if you're in the right and they're if you're in the right system. But, you know, getting back to that process with me and franchising, it's a lot of integrity in this system. Franchising is regulated by the federal government. There is a franchise disclosure document that all brands are required to present to an individual, to a prospect that's looking at a franchise. It's 23 items, including an earnings claim, actual costs and what it costs to open, not projections. And the last part of the process that's so amazing is all of my candidates will have an opportunity to speak to existing, live, successful franchisees of each of these brands to understand, most importantly, is Brian Hammer capable of doing this? That's what you need to understand. And that's what I direct my clientele to understand, because there's a lot of people, Brian, that say to me, well, how do I know if I'm going to be, if I'm going to pick the right brand? I said, I'm going to make sure you pick the right brand. What I'm more concerned about is you. Are you going to be able to do the tasks required to be successful in this brand? People fail like they fail in marriages. My first marriage was a disaster. I was with her a long time. <clears throat> she probably didn't like me at all either, but it was a failure. We fail in business, we fail in relationships all the time because we set ourselves up for failure. So that's why you work with a franchise broker consultant like me. And keep in mind, I get paid like a recruiter. I'm in the best business there is because you don't pay me anything at all. And if you never found me, you pay the same franchise fee to join the brand. Lance, if someone comes to you and says, I want to invest in a franchise, but I want to do it passively. I don't want to have to go hire people and, and go to the, the store or the, the location. I just want someone to, to run it and make sure it's profitable and I make a, a passive income. What do you say to that person? We do have some like that. A lot of people laugh when that question comes up because like, they think it's impossible. But there are some, I mentioned Spray Foam Genie. There's some like Spray Foam Genie that are like that, that are basically almost 100% absentee and you can do it from three states away. Let's talk about Pink Box. You set that up. That, that's your franchise. You kind of originated that. Yeah, I don't know if they're officially franchising now. We were set up for franchising or starting that process when I left. But, you know, I didn't have 100% control of that. I 100% I set it up and opened it. But I had 30% equity. I had a guy that called me and said, hey, can you, I want to Put in some money to do something like a gourmet donut shop. He had the name, the idea for the name, and I did everything. Came up with a hundred and some recipes, hired a baker friend of mine, and continued to do some other stuff on the side. But it was, it, you know, we did 591,000 the first year out of eight, 880 square feet where we actually made the donuts in that tiny little closet sized space. And the second year we did 1.1 million. And that's not counting any wholesale business. That was just people walking in the front door. In setting it up, setting up Pink Box for a franchise, what what were the directives you set for yourself? Like, here's what you absolutely wanted to make sure you got right. And here's what you wanted to avoid. Like, what was the thought process there? I'll make it even more broad, setting up any franchise, because part of my business today is talking to independent business owners that think they have a success on their hand and might be interested in growing and scaling a franchise system. And I should tell you and the audience, one of the most 
significant things about setting up your independent business to franchise is there are exits right now as large as 30 times cash flow. Normally, you can sell for 10 times cash flow, 15, but recent one, 3 million in cash flow, he sold for 90 million bucks. What I look for is a model that can be duplicated and executed throughout the country, obviously. Uh, I look for some semblance of success. There needs to be enough profit that you could then charge somebody else a royalty. So restaurants can be tough because restaurants notoriously have slimmer margins. So you gotta, you gotta look at that. Then you have to look at the leadership team. I actually had a founder of a brand say, yeah, I don't wanna mentor anybody. I'm not really that good with people. Well, that's a problem. Do you wanna hire somebody to take your place in mentoring You know, as a COO or director of training? Because we can work around that, but we still need somebody that's going to be amazing to train these people and mentor and support these people. But other than that, if your systems are not all dialed in, that's not a bad thing. <laughs> you know, when I joined Wingstop, when I joined Krispy Kreme, there were a lot of systems that weren't necessarily in place. The early Wingstop operations manual, when they had 90 stores open, that looked more like a recipe book and a, and a guide on how to wash your hands effectively. But there wasn't a lot in the way of customer service or scripts on how to appropriately fulfill an order. A lot of instructions on how to manually write a ticket in the old day of, of Wingstop, in the old days of Wingstop. So having all of your ducks in a row isn't as important, in my opinion. My old friend, another Brian, gave me a, a, a great piece of advice years ago, done beats perfect. I know people that try to perfect their business systems for years before they take that next step to franchise. That is a waste of time. If you have something that's already profitable, you have something that generally people are asking for. So when I opened the first pink box, people assumed it was a franchise already. That was the best compliment I could ever get, is that people assume there's a lot more of these locations. So that's a great perception. So some sort of good profitability brand that looks like it can be something big. Federal trademark is definitely preferable. If you don't have a federal trademark, there's a workaround, but it's a real pain in the neck. And, and, and hopefully it's a niche that it, there's not too much in. I mean, look, when Five Guys Burgers came about, guess what? A lot of people said another burger concept, but it was different. It was different. I have a painting franchise. It's one of the hottest home service brands I've ever seen. And everybody said another painting franchise, but that one painter did it differently. They have in-house marketing. They're more aggressive. They have a unique system. It's a lower cost. A lot of investor types are getting into that one painter for that reason, because they have a regional de developer model for investors, where you're not doing much of the work, they're hiring you someone to put in place. So a lot of opportunities if you, you have an independent business, you're looking to grow. I have a, a great mortgage franchise we just set up. They've already, they already have four franchisees, and that, that's going to be a hot, hot brand. Take a moment to kind of promote your services. Like who should contact you? People who are looking to buy into a franchise, current business owners who want to franchise their business. How how would they get a hold of you and, and where would they find out more about you? Both people can work, can uh, reach out, of course. And, and really it's anybody looking at business ownership. A lot of people have no idea. Every guru on the internet today is talking about buying an existing business. That is fantastic. But most people are looking way too long. Time is our most precious commodity, our precious resource. So the easiest thing is to just get into a proven franchise and, and start from there. So LanceGralic.com, IonFranchising.com, and I'm all over the internet. So feel free to, to DM me, Brian, and I'm happy to send you the assessment or jump on a call. And then the last question for you, what's your favorite hack or app? These days, it's probably, I love Instagram. I love that Instagram app. I, I, I get a lot of leads from that. So I, I'm on Instagram all the time.
You shared a lot of great information on franchising and, and you know, given your experience, you know, it's coming from a, you know, someone who really knows what they're talking about. So thank you so much for having this conversation with us today. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you for having me. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com.